How many loves the Lord this morning? We were giving away the gifts. I forgot to get the drum roll. I see it's going to take a lot to resurrect us this morning. A whole lot. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3, 4, and 5. I thank God, whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the sincere faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois, in thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. The uh, message is a very, very simple title this morning. Grandpas. How many grandpas do we have this morning? Grandmas. How many grandmas do we have? And I'm going to put this more personal than what I gave joy. Your grandchildren need the Bible. Grandpas, grandmas, your grandchildren need the Bible. This morning we are, we are aware that this is Grandparents Day. And not only are we aware of it, but we have chosen to celebrate it in such manner. To many people, this day is not so well known at all. In other words, there's a lot out there that does not recognize this as National Grandparents Day. Don't know anything about it. One of God's commandments is found in Exodus 20 and 12. Honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. In other words, when you honor your parents in reference to your grandchildren, then you you, you are honoring their grandparents as well. David has this to say in Psalms 103 and 17. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him and his righteousness unto children's children. This morning as we are focusing on this particular subject of Grandparents Day, I really wonder, do we recognize the door of opportunity that has been opened to us by our Lord? There's no doubt in my mind that our grandparents today are being driven to fulfill much greater responsibilities to fill the gaps in the lives of some of their grandchildren. Consider, for example, the the reality that nowadays there's a need for both parents to work in order to cope with the finances, the needs of the family. The question is this, who do you think gets to spend more quality time with these children Come on, y'all. It's the grandparents. But what a tremendous privilege that we have to fulfill that calling that we have the privilege to imprint upon their lives the fear and the love of God as their children. Let me read a piece from an unknown eight-year-old that he or she wrote to give an eight-year-old's perspective of a grandmother. I'm not responsible for the contents that's in this. It's just a quote, okay? Here it goes. This is good to start with. A grandmother is a lady who has no children of her own. She likes other people's boys and girls. Grandmas don't have anything to do except be there. 
if they, t- if, if they take care of us or she walk, takes care of us and walks us, then she slows down and shows us the pretty leaves and the pretty flowers and the pretty caterpillars. They, they never say, hurry up. And I'm not responsible for them getting ready to read. And usually they are fat. <laughs> but not fat enough but what they can't tie your shoes. We got some grandmas in here that can't tie shoes. Let's move on. They wear glasses. And sometimes they can take their teeth out. (laughs) They can answer questions like, why does dogs really hate cats? Why isn't God married? They talk, but they don't talk like visitors. Visitors are just so hard to understand. And even when they read to us, they don't skip any words. Or they don't mind if it is the same story over and over and over again. How many of you have seen cartoons over and over and over again? Everybody should try to have a grandma, especially if you don't have a television. Now, this this last statement is very important. Because grandmas are the only grown-ups who always have time. Unquote. There's a grandmother in the Bible that sees the door of opportunity to minister to her daughter, which was Eunice, and her grandson, Timothy. And, of course, this was Lois. Lois is the only grandmother mentioned in the Bible as such as with that title. Did you know that? In fact, here's what her name really means. Mammy. Did you know that's what I call my grandma? Mammy. And I call my granddad Papa. Amen. How about you? I imagine you got some different probably titles for what, the reasons you called your grandma what you called them or your grandpa what you called them. These two women, Timothy's mother and grandmother, had raised him not only in the faith, but also in the study of the sacred scriptures, of the writings. It was this early story of sacred writings that they carried on in their home, that grounded the soul of that of young Timothy and prepared him to become an apostle of the church and the bishop of that of Ephesus. The whole church for the past 2,000 years owes to these two women an immense and unpayable debt of gratitude. When as a child, Timothy was taught the grammar of that of the Holy Scripture. What did he learn from those Holy Scriptures? What did he learn from Lois? What did he learn from Eunice? Here's the first thing. Timothy learned to take possession of his own heart. Can I get an amen on that? Because of the Holy Scripture, because of the Holy Word of God, Timothy learned to take possession of his own heart, placing his young soul under the authority of the Holy Scripture. Timothy learned who he was. Anybody seen these young people today? Anybody seen their grandkids? Did all together know who they are? The Holy Word of God helped Timothy to learn who he was. But not only who he was, but his place as far as his place in the world. He learned what God expected of him and what he himself could expect both during his life and the end of it. Boy, y'all, that's some good sayings right there, aren't they? The study of the scripture was not a private thing. Thanks to that of the generations, the older generations that instructed him. And those longer generations 
to which his mother and grandmother were heirs. Timothy was enabled to read the Holy Scripture and understand it properly. And here's the third thing. Timothy himself was part of the history of the created, uh, of the, of the, of the created that was created by the Holy Scripture. While the, the Apostle Paul draws our attention as far as to that of Lois, his grandmother, to her sincere faith, where did that faith come from? And the Apostle Paul tells us this, Romans 10 and 17, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Grandmas, grandpas, mothers, fathers, grandchildren need the word of God. Isaiah 34 and 16. Seek ye out of the book of the Lord, he says, and read. I got five things that I got to hasten to you that you might want to write these things down and come back and look at them a little bit later. Here's the first thing. The Bible is commanded to be studied. The Apostle Paul, after his apostolic greeting, he recognizes Lois' sincere faith. And he encourages Timothy to be a good soldier. In the time of apostasy, a good soldier is a good workman. And a good workman is a skilled craftsman. And in 2 Timothy 2 and 15, a little bit later, here's what Paul would say. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman, a skilled craftsman, that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The Bible is commanded to be studied and it's needed to be studied every day. I want you to listen to this. Joshua is going to be commissioned by that of God. And he says, Moses, my servant is now, is dead. But here's what God has to say to Joshua. Joshua 1 and 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then shalt thou make thy way prosperous, and thou shalt have good success. I've got a question to you. Do you want your grandchildren to succeed? Do you want your grandchildren to be prosperous? Then you know what you need to do? You need to get them in the Word of God. God tells that of Joshua, he says, Joshua, he says, you take the word of God and you meditate in God's word. You meditate day in and you, take, you meditate day, day out. He says, if you would do it night and day, he says, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to prosper you. You're going to be a success. I know most of you in this service this morning, you love your grandchildren. You love your children and you love your grandchildren. But one of the best ways for them to succeed in life and prosper in life is that you have a little window of time when they're very young. Because look at it, most of us are older and we can go at any time. Ain't that right, Billy? And we need to get God's word to them, the Bible. That they may prosper, that they may succeed, that they may be a success in their life. And that's what God told Joshua about his word. Meditate day, meditate night, that God may bless you, that you may prosper, that you may succeed. You remember the temptation of Jesus in Matthew 4 and 4? He answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. How many remembers in the book of Acts chapter 17 and 10, after Paul and Silas leave that of Thessalonica, it says, and the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night into Bera, 
It says, who coming whether they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Verse 11. They received the word of the word with all readiness of mind. They searched the scripture daily whether those things were so. The Bible is to be studied by portions and memorized. Psalm 119 and 11. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. I came into the fellowship building last Sunday morning. Renee was there, and she was there with Ethan. And I'm always cutting up and carrying on with Ethan. And Renee says to Ethan, says, Ethan, uh, give Brother Ronnie your memory verses, what you have learned during the week. And the first one, it's been a week now, has kind of slipped my mind. But I remember the second one that Ethan quoted. And you know what he quoted? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Amen. That's a good verse. And then it said Genesis 1 and 1. Matter of fact, he quoted me this morning something from the epistle of that, uh, of Peter this morning, another verse. In other words, get him the word of that of God. Get him that of the Bible. God's word is to be commanded, to be studied. We need to look at portions and, and, and we need to re remember as much as we can, and we need to pass them on to our kids and to that of our grandkids. So the Bible is commanded to be studied. And there's some reasons why. And we're going to go on to the second point. Here's another reason. Because the Bible is God's message to mankind. Throughout the world, we have spent millions upon millions, upon billions, and probably on every continent that I know of, that we got dishes out there in the fields, and we send it out messages out yonder, and we're just waiting to hear that there is intelligent life out there. And you know what? All along, we have already have received a message, not from just heaven and not from just a second heaven, but we have received message from that of the third heaven. We have received a message from that of God. We've got a message from God right before us. You see, the Bible is God's inspired message. 2 Timothy 3 and 16. I want you to listen to this. Joy's going to pull it up. Joy, just leave it there for just a little bit. I want to read this. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. In other words, for God to inspire people means that God breathed upon them. So God breathed upon them. And it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And I, and I thought several days ago, no wonder this world does not want the Bible. No wonder we like to take the Bible out of our schools because it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof. You know what, Orman? There's a lot of people that don't want to stand corrected by God. And they don't want instruction and righteousness. Yo, know, this, is, this is a message. And this is a message from God. And this is God's inspired word. God breathed upon holy men of old. Amen? And they pen the word of God. The Bible is God's eternal message in 1 Peter. But the word of the Lord endured forever. And this is the word by which the gospel is preached unto you. And that's not always very effective because in Isaiah 55 and 11, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please and shall prosper in the things where, he says, to I sin it. Did you know in the book of Genesis chapter 1, we have these words at least nine times. 
And God said, and God said, and God said, and God said nine times. And did you know when God said, did you know things began to happen? Did you know that God, Omen, God's word did not turn back void? But when, when God spoke, it accomplished that of which it was sent out. The first day light was diffused. The second day vapor was above and water below. The third day the land and sea and the plant life appear. The fourth day the sun, the moon, the stars become visible. The fifth day there was animal life. Amen. And the sixth day we know there was a creation of man. But when God spoke, things began to happen. But here's the third thing. And this is very important. The Bible reveals the way of that of salvation. Don't you love your grandchildren? I've heard it put like this, and I don't know I'm having problems with that, this, this particular statement, because I just, I just do. You love your children, but when the grandchildren come along, that's just such a special love that we have for them. I think the special love that you have for them is you get the love on them and then you get to send them back where they came from. I think that's what your special love is. But studying the Bible, God's message to mankind, it reveals the way of salvation. You that have grandchildren and me, we took our, we drew our name. That was not planned. You know, Ethan just drew our name right out of the pot. We kind of put it to the side. We didn't think, want children to think this was rigged. <laughs> but most of all that you should want for your grandchildren is for your grandchildren to be saved. That should be the number one priority. And you know what? You as a grandpa or grandma, if you do not let your light shine before them, if you don't tell them about God, there may not be anybody else to tell them about God. And you should desire that these, the, your grandchildren, that your grandchildren should be saved. That should be first and most important of all. You see, because the reason that the Bible was written, it was written to reveal to us Jesus. G uh, John 20 and 30. Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are written uh, in this book, verse 31. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing that you might have life through his name. The Bible was written to search our hearts. Hebrews 4 and 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. Piercing even to divide and asunder of soul and spirit. And the joints of the, mar of the marrow. And the sun of the thoughts and the intents of that of the heart. I'm reminded of a king. Brother Orton, you remember who he was? A young eight-year-old boy that would begin to grow. And they found the law in the, in the temple that had needed repair. And Josiah thought, hey, we, we, we seem like we're doing pretty good. But once he began to read the law and the word of God, he ripped his clothes and repented and turned back to God. And there was a great revival. You know what? We don't need altogether everybody's opinion. It's what God says to us. Because it searches our hearts. You see, because the Bible was written to give us a foundation for faith. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of that of God. Faith is a substance of things hoped for. You know what? We got a lot of grandchildren today. Grandboys, grandgirls. 
They don't seem like they have any hope. But you know what, y'all? Y'all give them the Bible. You give them Jesus. Give them heaven. Amen? Amen. This creates a hope. Faith is counting Him faithful who had promised. Faith is accounting God as being able. Faith is for our firm expectation, free from all doubt. Faith is a reckoning of things as ours already. Faith is the unhesitant assurance of the fulfillment of God's promises. Faith is taking God at His word. And then here's the fourth thing. The Bible is spiritual food. In Luke 1 and 80, we have the birth of John the Baptist. The child grew and right strong in spirit and was in the desert till the days of his showing. How many remembers the silent years of Jesus? Maybe 2 to 12. Jesus returns to Nazareth. Luke 2 and 40. The child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. How many remembers the Apostle Peter's last words in 2 Peter 3 and 18? But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be, be a glory both now and forever. Amen. In the praise and the worship hymnal on page 397, there was a song written by C.B. Weinmeyer. And it has this. This might be Sister Peggy Williams' favorite song. Jesus has a table spread where the saints of God are fed. He invites His chosen people to come and dine. With this manna He does feed and supplies our every need. Oh, sweet to sup with Jesus all the time. Sister Peggy, ain't that one of your favorites? According to Orman. It is milk. It is milk to those that are babes in Christ. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk, milk of the word that she may grow by. To the young person, it is honey. Psalm 119 and 103. It tells us about how sweet are the words of thy taste. Yea, sweeter than honey to me. And to the adult, it is meat. But strong meat belongeth to them that of a full age. Even to those by reason of use have that their senses exercised to be discerned. It says both good and evil. So it's food. And I've gone hastily through, but here's the last thing. The Bible is the road map of life. Sister Mary, I had a flashback. My mind went back 15 to 20 years ago when I first came to this church. John Fleming, he took me fishing. I remember getting in his boat and I remember he had some modern technology and I remember he had a little, look like a disc and he put this disc in his modern technology. You got to remember my electronics, Jonathan, was what I first saw was the dot to dot game. My, what are they going to do next? Sit in front of that, ma- I was going to call it a maggot box, it's a magna box. Don't remember that? When the TV, the most important TV, part of the TV was the furniture. People bought TVs because of the way the furniture looked and it sat on the floor. Y'all remember that? And you sat on the shag carpet. Anybody remember shag carpet? In front of the TV and you were playing dot to dot. What in the world are they going to come up with next? Oh, matter of fact, you just got that new Odyssey game that had ping pong because you just bought a new Magnavox television, 25 inch. Have you ever heard this saying, you come a long way, baby? Nah, I skipped that. That's, that could be a cigarette commercial. Forget that. <laughs> Going back to John. I said, John, what are you doing? 
I'm putting a highway on the ocean. A what? A highway on the ocean. Brother Frederick, that screen showed a road right on the ocean. And here he is staring. He says, we're going yonder. And Ron, he said, the thing about it is, we can get there and we can turn around and we can come back in just about the exact place that we went out. I think they call this a GPS. I think it's a global yeah, position. <laughs> you know I wouldn't say this not unless I known this. <laughs> System. I said, I said, this is amazing. And now we got cars that can, and thank the Lord for this, that can parallel park their sales now. You want your grandson? You want your granddaughter? And that little window that you have of time, if you give them the Bible, you've given to them the road map of life. Ain't that good? Boy, we have come a long way from dot to dot, haven't we? That's amazing. Even Brother Jonathan showing us the website and setting this up for the church. We may be one of the last churches to have something like this. No? No. Okay. John 14 and 5. These are spoken in the Passover chamber. You remember when Jesus tells his disciples, let not your hearts be, tr be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me and my Father's house, so many mansions in it. If it were not so, I've told you, and I go to prepare a place for you. If I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come again, receive you into myself. Then Thomas says this, Lord, we know not where thou goest, and how can we know the way? In verse 6, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man can come unto the Father but by me. How many have seen those little stickers on the bumpers? Why can't we coexist? Anybody? It's got the different religions tied together. Why can't we coexist? You know what? I guess, Jonathan, we can live together on the face of this earth, but i got news for you. This Bible don't give us but one road map, and it's Jesus. And he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And, and don't, ain't that what you want down there, Brother English? But ain't that what you want to give your grandchildren? I mean, you love them so dearly. Give them something that this really matters more than anything else. The road map. How many of you have ever heard this song before? I'm using my Bible for road map. Isaiah said it's a highway. In Isaiah 35 and 8, and the highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. But it shall, it says, be for the wayfaring men, though fools, he said, shall not err therein. How about what David says? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. This Bible is a reading lamp, it's a heat lamp, it's a traveler's lamp, it's a miner's lamp, and it's a lighthouse. And then Jesus says on the Sermon on the Mount, 7 and 13, Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. As I've been preaching this morning, I've had a few more flashbacks, and probably some of you is probably saying, no wonder he's, uh, <laughs> he's preached like he has. He's been flashbacking all during the morning. But I thought about my grandma and my granddaddy. 
Granddaddy was born like in 1899. Grandma was born like in 1900. And you know the personality and character that I have, correct? Deborah in particular knows that? Well, I got it from my dad and I got it from my granddad. I understand that. But that was my grandma. And I can see Mammy sitting back in the chair. That's what I call her, Mammy. She'd be sitting back in her chair. And I remember Mammy, says Peggy, she got to the age that she would be talking to you, but she called the whole row, the whole family before she got your name right. Anybody know any of those? Skip, Dallas, uh, Dan, no, Ronnie. Okay. And I, I'm going to share this with you. Mammy had drooping lobes. Anybody know what drooping lobes are? As a matter of fact, she didn't wear earrings, but I'm just, I'm just saying that is droop naturally. And I would go up to Mammy and say, and, and just do that to Mammy. Do that to Mammy. I said, Mammy, do you know what kind of fish I could just catch with that little piece right there? Go on, cut it off, Ronnie. Go on, cut it off. You know, she knew we were just carrying on. But I have fond memories of my grandma and granddad, but my grandma in particular. But I remember about her, and I remember most of all about her. She was a very good Christian woman. And my granddaddy aggravated her to death. <laughs> very seldom did I hear her say <laughs> anything out of the ordinary. <laughs> but I remember her. So this may be a reflection on maybe your grandma and your granddaddy and then back on you. Lois, you know what she did? She had a sincere faith. Oh, I mean, she passed it on. And she pa passed it on to Eunice. And she passed it on to Timothy. And Timothy became a great apostle and the bishop of Ephesus because of his grandparent and his mom, but because of his, really his grandmother. What are you really passing on? You know, you say you love your children. I don't doubt you don't love your grandchildren. But what are you really passing on? I will, I, you know, let, let them know me more for wearing glasses and being fat and, <laughs> you know, about the shoe thing. Uh, and I hadn't got to the tea thing, but I'm not far from that, maybe. But, you know, I want them to know about Jesus, amen, and God's Word. How many has enjoyed being in church? I know we've been a little quiet. Amen. I want you to stand, please.